everyone welcome to week eight or what's also known as the beginning of the second half of the semester before we get started if any of you any one of you knows any one of my colleagues in the composition program and if you ask any of them what's the word that Lillian or Dr. Mina uses the most what's the word that she always says in reference to teaching, to learning, to everything. I think many of them will tell you the word theory and the connection between theory and practice and how everything we're doing as teachers is based on theory and practice together. So the word theory is very important to me. Um, but let me tell you something. Before I started my PhD studies, the word theory was hardly part of my lexicon. In the few instances it was, it always meant something abstract, like this background you're seeing on the screen now. Something complex, something beyond comprehension, something impractical. You got the idea. Fast forward to grad school days, when I found myself immersed <clears throat> and often lost in the theory jungle. No, 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 don't worry. I won't take you there now. I mean, I'm, I'm not that bad, I promise. In short, until I understood the role of theory in my learning, my own research, my teaching, and later my administrative job, the word always carried a negative, an anxiety fusing connotation to me. I can assume that it may have the same connotation to many of you, even though that you are more than halfway through your college career. Some of you graduated and are currently in grad school. Some of you graduated and have jobs. Some of you finished grad school. So, but the word theory is not really one of our favorite words to use. Porter's chapter this week is my attempt to help you be in a similar position to where I am now. Not before my glorious, <clears throat> you can insert cringe emoji here, by the way, grad school days. Porter of offers several definitions and conceptualizations of theory distinguishes it from theorizing, and please, please don't stop the, the recording, okay? Describes its main characteristics, and more importantly, he explains why theories are important and useful for technical communication as a field and as a profession. Porter particularly focuses on rhetoric theory and its position in technical communication. Since week one, we encountered the word rhetoric in our readings and work. We discuss purpose, audience, context, genre, medium, which are all pieces of the rhetoric puzzle. Porter's chapter brings all these pieces together to make a coherent whole of how rhetoric theory influences, shapes, and drives our work as technical communicators. He does that by asking us to think about technical communicator, sorry, technical communication as problem solving, a point we discussed at length earlier in the semester. When we approach any technical communication situation or job as a problem, we need to think of the audience, purpose, context, genre, and medium that together would help us solve that problem by creating effective documents using the appropriate genre, medium, and technology to address the audience's needs, achieve the intended purpose of that document. On page 127-128, Porter defines theory. I'm not going to read that because you have the book and you can read it, but I'd like for you to read those definitions and think of which one is closest to your own understanding of the word. What does each definition add to or challenge your own definition? I'd like you to particularly focus on the rhetorical and humanistic notion of theory, 
he talks about on page 128. And to reflect on the work you've been doing in this course or at your workplace, how does theory, specifically rhetoric theory, connect to and or interpret your work? As Porter moves to the characteristics of a theory, he knows that a theory challenges our common sense of concepts taken as natural or at face value on page 129. He then argued that the main test of a theory is its usefulness as it increases our understanding of a situation, helps us solve a problem, or allows us to generate new knowledge as he says in page 130. If a theory doesn't do any of these three things, it's useless and would die out after a short time of creating a buzz. Now, I'd like you to think of a communication problem that you're currently dealing with outside the scope of our course and tech MGM projects. So think of your personal or everyday life or your professional life. It can be a problem in your professional uh, domain and spend some time thinking about whether rhetoric theory can be useful to you in one or more of these three ways. After you finish reading the chapter and learning more about the role of rhetoric, sorry, the rhetoric theory in technical communication, I'd like, I'd like for you to think about your own theory of writing as a current or future technical communicator. How would you define your own theory of writing? What are its main characteristics? How useful is it to you? Do you think it's a static or a dynamic theory? Why and how? You can use the points in Porter's chapter to test your definition, characteristics, and uses of theory and to support your answer. So, I expect some of you will have questions about this chapter, so you know where to post them. And I'll see you all in class on Slack, where we'll be discussing rhetoric theory, your own theory of writing as a technical communicator, and we'll continue to have our fun. Happy theorizing, everyone. See you on Slack.